Welcome to Unit 3 of Epidemiology Essentials. In this third unit, we'll be looking at the epidemiologic study designs. Here we see a pictorial representation of the classification of the various study designs that we have in epidemiology. So broadly speaking, they are divided into observational and experimental or interventional designs. And under the observational designs, we have those that are descriptive, and those that are analytic. And under experimental designs, we have randomized control trials, field trials, and community trials. Again, this table shows the various classification and the alternate names for the various study designs. If you learn about different study designs and the advantages and disadvantages, you are in a better position to interpret and evaluate the results from various research. The most important distinction of an experimental study design compared with a non-experimental or observational study design is the exposure assignment. One example of these would be randomizing one group of patients to get the new breast cancer chemotherapy drug and the other group of patients to receive the current standard chemotherapy. Note that the exposure is the intervention. For example, a new drug treatment and in an experimental study, the, investigation, the investigator usually determines who is exposed and who is not exposed. The exposure or intervention is randomly allocated to study participants. To test if bed nets reduced infants contracting and dying from malaria, researchers randomized the group of infants to receive bed nets from birth onward. The control group of infants received bed nets only after six months. The researchers found that the use of bed nets in infants reduced the rate of both developing malaria and dying from malaria. In a non-experimental observational study, the investigator does not assign exposure status. For example, in an observational study on the health effects of living near nuclear reactors, such as Fukushima, the investigator does not assign some people to live near the nuclear reactor and others to live far away from the reactor. Another example of a non-experimental study would be to follow a group of diabetes patients over time, some of whom smoke tobacco and some don't, and then look at what their rates of cardiovascular disease will turn out to be. So we, we begin with the first study design, which is experimental study design. An important difference between experimental and non-experimental studies is the randomly assigned exposure. Randomization is about is important because it minimizes differences in key characteristics between the group that gets the exposure and the group that does not get the exposure. But it's not ethical to randomly expose people to serious hazards such as radiation, toxic chemicals, or inadequate health care. Therefore, experimental study designs don't work for everything. Instead, researchers use observational study designs in those circumstances. In experimental studies, subjects are assigned by formal, usually chance mechanism between two or more exposures or interventions. Exper experimental studies are the gold standard for inferring causality. Commonly, experimental studies provide participants with an exposure, such as a drug, that may be either therapeutic or preventative. The provided intervention is usually randomly allocated to study subjects by the researcher. Next, we'll cover the ideal type of experimental study, which is the randomized control trial. In a randomized control trial, the treatment of interest, such as a new drug, will be randomly allocated to half of the study subjects, and the other group will receive a placebo or the current standard of care or medication for that disease. An example of a randomized control trial would be a study comparing two different treatments for arthritis. Subjects will be randomized to one of the two arthritis treatments. There are both individual and community experimental studies. An example of an individual experimental study is where the one group receives an experimental drug aimed at preventing Alzheimer's disease in an arthritis group, while another arthritis group receives a placebo. Experimental studies can also be targeted to communities rather than individuals. 
An example of a community intervention is a colon cancer screening program that was implemented in nine counties and seven control counties who did not receive the screening program. In an individual level experimental study, some study participants are assigned an exposure and the remaining participants are assigned to be unexposed or exposed to a different factor. In a community level experimental study, one or more communities are assigned to an exposure. One or more other communities are assigned to be unexposed or exposed to a different factor. Randomized control trials are often used to test the effectiveness of new interventions or compare the effectiveness of two or more interventions. The key feature is randomization. That is, subjects should be systematically assigned to the study groups in such a way that each has an equal chance of being placed in each of the groups. And this is known as random allocation. Randomization eliminates selection bias which leads to wrong conclusions about relationships between variables. It's also important that the intervention group and the control group are comparable in all aspects except that intervention itself. For example, the proportion of females and the age distribution should be similar in both groups since these variables could have an influence on the effect of the intervention and thus impacts the research findings if disproportionately represented in one group. Randomization also helps to ensure even distribution of known as well as unforeseeable confounders, though this may not always be guaranteed. Randomization provides the strongest evidence for causal inference. Randomization basically allows us to ask if everything else is the same, what is the effect of just exposure on the outcome? For example, if assignment of a treatment was not random, the researchers might not might seek select which participants go, got which treatment based on patient characteristics such as severity of illness. This could bias the study results. Randomization is done with a computer software or some other method which is used to assign subjects or groups to receive one exposure or treatment or another. It is the most important component of the experimental study design. Now let's look at an example of a randomized controlled trial. Researchers designed a randomized control trial to ask, answer this research question. Do U.S. Postal Service mailmen who receive a specific sun safety education intervention subsequently wear wide-brimmed hats and use sunscreen more than U.S. Postal Service mailmen who did not receive the sun safety education intervention? The intervention included six educational sessions, wide-brimmed hats, sunscreen, and reminders. Workers were randomized to sun safety promotion or delayed sun safety promotion education. Postal workers in the intervention group received six educational sessions and were provided with wide brim hats, sunscreen, and reminders. The postmen were then followed up for two years to assess the outcome. The researchers found that the postmen who received the intervention had increased use of sunscreens and hats compared with the control group. What are the key advantages of randomized control trials? First, randomization reduces confounding, that is the influence of other factors that could determine the outcome of interest. This study design provides strong evidence for causality or causal inference. Since investigators assign the exposure, the time or temporal relationship between the exposure and outcome is clear. So while there are advantages to randomized control trials, it is important to know that there are also disadvantages. Randomized control trials can be costly. Sometimes, randomized control trials have issues with external validity. People who participate in trials may be very different from the rest of the population. Thus, the effects seen in the participants may not be generalizable to the population at large. In addition, there are ethical considerations when randomizing treatments or exposures. For example, it would be unethical to do a study that would involve randomizing people to be exposed to a non-toxic substance, such as water containing high levels of arsenic, mercury, or lead. To summarize, in the randomized control trial, researchers follow the treatments and intervention and the control comparison group to see who develops the health outcome or disease of interest. We now look at some important terms using experimental study designs. The first is blinding. In the context of experimental study designs, blinding is a technique used to conceal certain information from different people involved with a study. 
this is the important this is important because knowledge of certain information could lead to biases in the study for example if a subject knows that they received a trial therapy they may report their symptoms activity levels or level of well-being differently than if they didn't know whether they got the medication or not similarly because they are very invested in a trial medication working the researchers may perceive or interpret data differently in those who received the medication than those who did not. Therefore, it may be necessary to prevent researcher and study subjects from knowing who received what. A single blinded study is one wherein either the subject or the researcher or the analyst, that is just one category, is blinded. In a double blinded study, both the subject and the researcher are blinded. In a triple blinded study, the subject, the researcher, and the statistical analyst are all blinded. What is a placebo? These are sham medications that appear identical to the real treatment but lack that treatment's active agent. Placebos are used in order for the different groups to, to not realize if they are exposed or unexposed to the intervention or drug under investigation which would affect the participant's behavior or measured health outcome. Compliance or adherence refers to whether or not participants follow the treatment medications or recommendations, as some participants may not stick with their assigned treatment or exposure. When we talk about intention to treat analysis, we usually refer to when subjects are analyzed according to their randomized treatment, regardless of whether they actually got or took that treatment. This concludes our discourse on exper experimental study designs. The most important thing to remember is that randomization of exposure is a key component of an ideal experimental study design. Now we look at cohort study design. Cohort studies are a type of observ observational study. With the cohort study design, researchers follow an at-risk at study population over time and evaluate exposures over time and determine the subsequent risk or rate of disease or health outcome. Historically, the word cohort was used to describe a subunit of a Roman legion of soldiers. This historic reference may help you remember the image of a group of people marching through time. A cohort is typically defined as a group of persons sharing a common characteristic. Epidemiologists may define their cohort by any number of shared factors. Some examples of a common characteristic are geographic location, occupation, socioeconomic status, etc. A famous example of a cohort study was initiated in the early 1950s by Richard Dahl and Sir Austin Bradford Hill. Dahl and Hill began a 20-year study following a cohort of British physicians. The common characteristic defining this cohort was that they were male doctors whose names were in the 1951 British Medical Register. Thus, the characteristics used to assemble the cohort were occupation, being physicians, and geographic location, being in Britain. At the outset of the investigation, the relevant demographic exposure or other factors were determined for each sub subject. The main baseline exposure of interest in this study was tobacco, cigarette smoking. Smoking was determined by questionnaires at baseline. The study subjects were asked if they were current smokers, past smokers, or had never smoked. The outcome of interest was death. The mortality data was obtained from the Registrar General of the United Kingdom and, and complemented records from the British Medical Association. In the United States, you may have heard of cohorts such as the Women's Health Initiative. This cohort was, compromi was comprised of 93,676 postmenopausal women between the ages of 50 and 79 and followed for approximately eight years. Other cohorts include the National Children's Study, a cohort of pregnant women in the United States, and the Framingham Heart Study. What do all these cohorts have in common? They were assembled with common characteristics such as age and gender in mind. These cohorts then had key exposure characteristics assessed at baseline, and then the people participating were followed over time. The basic design of a cohort study ideally begins with a well-designated source population. This population, or random sample, is then assessed and subjects are removed who already have the outcome or disease of interest 
such as lung cancer or cardiovascular disease, or who don't meet whatever pre pre designated inclusion criteria that investigators have decided upon. The goal here is that the eligible study population both accurately and efficiently represent the source population. For example, in a cohort study of prostate cancer, we would not want to include women. One criteria of our source population for this example would therefore be gender. Cohort studies track participants over time. The subjects in the cohort study are selected to be free of the outcome of interest at the study outset. So it is clear that the exposure precedes the outcome. The exposure of interest is measured in all subjects at baseline and or at regular time points during the course of the study. Once the cohort is assembled and the baseline exposures are measured, study subjects are then followed up over time. The occurrence of this specific disease or how the outcome of interest is developed is followed closely. New outcome events such as incidents, cases of disease, death or a health status change accounted for all measures of the cohort throughout the follow-up period. These new cases of the outcome are used to calculate whatever measures of incidence are relevant to the study, usually a rate or a risk. In the cohort of British physicians we mentioned earlier, the main exposure of interest in the study was smoking. It was determined by questionnaires at baseline. The study subjects were asked if they were current smokers, past smokers, or had never smoked. The outcome of interest was mortality. Investigators may select a cohort specifically to study certain uncommon or rare exposures. In some cohort studies, population groups like with known exposures to a suspected hazardous substance or environment are first identified and recruited for study. Next, another population or group without that exposure is identified. Then the risk or rate of that outcome over time is compared in the two groups. For this reason, cohort studies can be particularly useful for studying uncommon or rare exposures because usually it's possible to identify and assemble groups of persons who have that uncommon exposure. Other studies may create categories such as an amalgam of risk factors for the disease or outcome under study. Famous Framingham cardiovascular cohort study provided much of the evidence of what is known today regarding the risk of heart disease. The study subjects were initially categorized according to suspected risk factors, creating risk groups for comparison. These risk groups were then followed for 20 to 30 years. The development of cardiovascular disease among the various risk groups was then compared with statistical anal analysis. A cohort study of US Air Force veterans from the Vietnam War was set up to ex examine the effects of exposure to Agent Orange, the foliants dropped by planes during the campaign. This group of veterans were compared to Air Force pilots active at the time with no involvement in the Agent Orange campaign. Attempting to conduct, to conduct this study in general population would have not been possible as exposure to Agent Orange is too rare. A common measure of health outcome occurrence in a cohort study is a risk or a rate. Since cohort studies are chosen to be free of the outcome of interest at the outset, only new health outcome events such as diseases, behavior change, injury, or health improvement in health status are considered. We will now discuss the type of study population followed in a cohort study. Cohort study populations can be open or closed. In an open cohort, individuals are allowed to join the study at any point in time, from the beginning to the end within, lim within limitations. In a closed cohort, the entire cohort is formed at the beginning of the study and the cohort is closed to new participants. An open study population collects present time. An open study population is also less prone to problems with sample size because study subjects can contribute present time even if they are in the study only for a short time. There are two types of cohort studies, retrospective and prospective studies, and these are classified according to their temporal sequence. Retrospective and prospective refer to the time the investigator initiates the study and starts collecting data. Both designs assemble cohorts on the basis of exposure first. In the retrospective study, the cohort is formed in the past and followed up to the present time. The prospective study starts now and goes on into the future. In the prospective study, the investigators obtain baseline exposure data in real time and then follow the cohort members during the time after baseline exposure to measure the occurrence of the health outcome or disease. The retrospective or historical cohort study is often used to evaluate
occupational exposure to potentially hazardous substances that cause cancer and other chronic diseases in workers. An example might be deaths from lung cancer among asbestos-exposed workers. Retrospective cohort studies are possible when historical records exist to identify the important baseline characteristics of studied subjects from prior years. For example, the list of workers employed at an asbestos mine between 1930 and 1940. The mortality experience of these workers can be traced through vital statistics and medical records from the baseline years to the present time and then compared with the similar non-asbestos mining cohorts or with the general population. The British Doctors' Study is an example of a prospective cohort study. Prospective or concurrent cohort studies assess the baseline exposure in real time and then cohorts are followed into the future. In this study, baseline measurements were made in real time of physicians' smoking habits as of 1951 when they received their initial questionnaire. Physicians were followed over time by a male questionnaire sent out every five or ten years and their mortality was tracked by extensive records kept on physicians in the United Kingdom. Thus, smoking exposure precedes mortality. Because exposure status was determined at baseline among living members of the British Medical uh, members of the British Medical Register in the study, we are certain that exposure preceded the outcome. Now let's talk about advantages of cohort studies. We will discuss the measures of association such as risk ratios and risk differences subsequently. So let's summarize by considering the advantages and disadvantages of cohorts. A big advantage of cohort studies is that they allow direct estimation of risk or rates. Investigators may specifically seek out individuals for study with an exposure that is not typical among the general population as you remember about the Agent Orange example. The ability to assess the effects of rare exposures is an advantage of the cohort study. Cohort studies can also be useful for assessing multiple outcomes. The various causes of mortality assessed in the British Physician Studies illustrate the ability to assess multiple outcomes of a single exposure. The researchers summarize their conclusions by identifying excess mortality among smokers by course. The advantages of cohort studies are that they are expensive and time-consuming. Our ability to detect relatively small differences in risk and rates between exposed and unexposed groups is primarily influenced by the number of health outcomes in each group rather than the number of persons in each exposed group. Thus, if there are relatively few persons in an exposure category, we may need a very long period of follow-up to observe sufficient numbers of rare outcomes in order to detect differences across levels of exposure. This accounts for the considerable cost and time needed to properly conduct a cohort study. If outcomes are very rare, then the size of the cohort groups will need to be very large to effectively detect a difference between study groups. Examples of rare outcomes include certain cancers such as acute leukemia or kidney cancer. Losses to follow up occur when we cannot determine the outcome for some measures of the cohort during the entire course of follow-up. If losses are greater than the exposed in the exposed versus the unexposed group or vice versa, we may obtain a biased estimate of the risk ratio or rate ratio. So we move over to case control study design. A good way to remember the case control study design is actually the name itself. With the case control study design, we start off with cases and controls, and then we look back in time to see what the exposures were. The choice of study design to address a specific research question will be driven by the nature of the disease or health outcomes being studied, the exposure of interest, the cost, the time, and the feasibility issues. Case control studies are an efficient and common epidemiologic study design to study rare diseases. In a case control study, Researchers begin by selecting diseased individuals or individuals with a health outcome of interest, known as the cases. Researchers also select a group of individuals without the disease or health outcome, and these are known as the controls. In contrast to the study design, the cohort study design, in case control studies, subjects are, subjected, are selected for study because they either have a disease of interest 
that is either that, that case or they do not have the disease of interest and they belong to the controls. Case control studies proceed logistically from effects, that is the disease or health outcome, to the cause, the exposure of interest, as the researchers look back in time to see what the exposure was in both the case group and the control group. There are three key steps in conducting a case control study. Step one, you find and select the cases. Cases are selected from a group that has the disease or health outcome of interest. Step two, you define and select the controls. Controls are the known cases that are representative of the same source population that give rise to the cases. Step three, we measure and compare the exposure prevalence in the controls versus the cases. Let's discuss case selection in more detail. Such as first determine the diagnostic criteria they will use to define a case. For example, if studying Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, which is a tick-borne disease, the di diagnostic definition of the disease should be clearly specified in order to classify people as cases or controls. In defining cases of Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, the diagnostic criteria should include the following symptoms. Fever, headache, nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pain. A very large proportion of cases also have a rash within 2 to 14 days of a tick bite. As a researcher, you could decide to not include rash as a symptom and make your definition slightly broader. Even though study cases should be representative of all cases, it is not necessary, necessary to enroll every case of the disease in your study. You may end up with a sample of cases that meet your diagnostic criteria from a specific population, such as a hospital, clinic, or other resource. The type of case you select is also important. It is better to use incident cases rather than prevalent cases. Prevalent cases are influenced by the duration of the disease. Next, we learn how to select controls for a study. When selecting controls for a study, researchers may include multiple controls per case or multiple control groups. Multiple controls per case can be used to help add statistical power when cases are unduly difficult to obtain. Statistical power refers to the size of your study and the ability of the study to detect an association if one actually exists. Sometimes researchers um, use more than one control group to see if the relationship they find are consistent across control groups. Consistency across control groups gives more credibility to the results. Now that we have discussed selection of cases and controls, we will consider how to compare exposure prevalence. Recall that the total number of exposed persons in a case control study is not that same as the total number of exposed persons in the source population. The same is true about the number of, of non-exposed. Thus, the denominators obtained in a case control study do not represent the total number of exposed and non-exposed persons in the source population. The investigators arbitrarily decide how many controls will be selected to compare with the cases. The consequence of this arbitrary selection is that we cannot measure risk or rates in a case control study directly because the population at risk, the denominator, is not ascertained. Instead, we use a measure called an odds ratio. The odds ratio is simply the odds of exposure for cases divided by the odds of exposure for controls. The odds ratio represents the strength of association between exposure and outcome. The odds ratio is obtained by creating a 2x2 two two table, which we will look at later. When is it best to use a case control study? Case control studies are best when the disease is rare. For example, studying risk factors for bed defects, or when exposure data are expensive or difficult to obtain. Case control studies are also useful when the disease has a long latent period for example, cancer or cardiovascular disease. And lastly, they are useful when little is known about the disease. For example, the studies of HIV AIDS when the pandemic began. Now, we will discuss the underlying source population for our case control study. The case population does not have to consist of all cases in a potential source population. It can be restricted to specific age range, sex, race, or socioeconomic status. For example, the majority of the Idaho may be a source population for the Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. But for a specific study, the researcher may restrict the case population to the, to the adults aged 
18 to 35 in Bannock County. Population controls can be obtained by probability sampling of the source population if the latter can be defined. Probability sampling can be done by sampling from a complete census of random digit dialing or by having a roster of all members of the source population, for example, union members, members of a professional association, or voter registration list if registration is mandatory. Controls should represent the restricted source population for which cases arise, not, not all non-cases in a total population. Now let's move to discuss the concept of matching in case control studies. We match to make sure that controls and cases are similar in variables which may influence the outcome we are studying. Matching means that for every case, there is at least one control who has the same or similar values of the matching variable. Matching may be by sex, age, race, or ethnic group, or other variables. Sometimes there is more than one control per case. Matching should be limited to one or more important and strong risk factors. Otherwise, it will be difficult to obtain matches for cases. Weak risk factors are not worth considering for matching. They can be easily evaluated if they are simply measured and considered in the statistical analysis. Matching on a variable prevents evaluating the effects of the match variable since this variable will be equal or similar between cases in controls. The important thing to remember about a case control study is that if it is done properly with the right kind of sampling, the information that we determine from a case control study can really mirror what can be found from a cohort study, but with a great deal of less cost and a lot less time. Now we we'll move over to cross-sectional studies. These are yet another type of observational study design. They are one of the four types of observational study designs. And like cohort studies, cross-sectional studies conceptually begin with the population base within which the occurrence of disease or health outcome and sometimes the simultaneous occurrence of the exposure will be studied. For example, the population could be all individuals currently living in Idaho Falls, or it could be all children aged five to six currently attending kindergarten in Pocatello, or it could be all taxi drivers currently working in Boise. A key aspect of a cross-sectional study is that the exposure and the outcome are assessed at the same point in time within the specified study population. If you conducted a cross-sectional study in the year 2020, you would first define your study population, for example, all, all adolescents in high schools in the city of Boise, Idaho. You could then survey all the high school students at school and ask them about their exposures to traffic pollution, for example, how close they live to heavily used roads. At the same time, you could also ask them if they currently had asthma or asthma-like symptoms. In this example, you obtain the information about both their exposure, which is traffic-related air pollution, and their health outcome, asthma, at one point in time. This is in contrast to the cohort study in which you start with assessing the presence of the exposure and then ascertaining the disease or outcome at a later date. The cross-sectional study design is also different from the case control study, which, as you might remember, starts with selected cases and controls and then looks back at exposures in the past. An easy way to think of a cross-sectional study design is as a snapshot of an exposure and a health outcome at one point in time. Here's an example. Among all individuals living in the United States, what is the prevalence of HIV infection? We can also apply the cross-sectional study design to the topic of distracting driving by looking at the study done by Vera Lopez et al. in the year 2013. Using a mobile phone for either talking or texting while driving a car can lead to traffic accidents. The study took place in 2011 and 2012 in Mexico. Mexico, like many countries, has a public health problem with regards to high rates of deaths from traffic accidents. Several municipalities have passed laws restricting mobile phone use while driving. The researchers selected three cities in Mexico. Their goal was to measure the prevalence of talking and texting on mobile phones among drivers in the three cities. A sample of 3% of all intersections with functioning traffic lights in all three cities was randomly selected. With this sampling method, 7,940 drivers and their vehicles were observed from 2011 to 2012. 
the overall prevalence of mobile phone use while driving was 10.8%. Now we will discuss the numerator and denominator of the prevalence measure used in cross-sectional studies. Cross-sectional studies are often used to describe the occurrence of a health outcome or exposure in the population. The measure used to describe this occurrence is prevalence. For the numerator, you will include all existing cases of the health outcome or disease in the population group, that is the prevalent cases. While for the denominator, you include all existing persons in the study population or among study participants, including both prevalent cases and non-cases. There are several ways in which cross-sectional studies may be used. Some cross-sectional studies characterize the prevalence of a health outcome or disease in a specified population in a defined period of time. Other cross-sectional studies obtain data on the prevalence of the exposure as well as the health outcomes or disease for the purpose of examining the association between these two variables. For example, is smoking among adolescents related to smoking in parents? Now let's look at how to conduct a cross-sectional study. Under steady state conditions, prevalence equals rates times average duration of the disease or health outcome. There are some limitations of cross-sectional studies. For instance, the prevalence is influenced by the rate and duration of the health outcome. For example, people who survive longer with a health outcome or disease will be more likely to be counted in the numerator of a prevalence proportion. Short-term survivors are not as likely to be counted as they are by definition around for a shorter time. Sometimes there can be issues with interpreting cross-sectional studies. Antecedent consequence bias affects cross-sectional studies and case control studies, but not cohort studies. In cohort studies, persons, persons are selected for study because they're exposed or not exposed why they are still at risk and thus disease-free. For example, if you are investigating diet and arthritis, in a cohort study, we obtain data on diet at baseline because before any of the study, subjects have um, evidence of arthritis. In a cross-sectional study, we ascertain dietary patterns at the same time as we obtain data on the presence or absence of arthritis. Thus, we cannot be sure that the exposure preceded the disease as they are both ascertained at the same time. So, what are cross-sectional studies used for? They are widely used to estimate the occurrence of risk factors, exposures, or health outcomes in the population. For example, a study to look at the prevalence of elevated blood lead in toddlers or the prevalence of asthma in children. National examples of cross-sectional studies of great importance are the Decennial Centers, the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, or the prevalence of HIV-positive antibodies in military recruits. Opinion pools and political pools are basically cross-sectional studies. Surveillance of changes in smoking habits of other behavioral risk factors are sequential cross-sectional studies. Similarly, surveillance of long-lasting diseases such as AIDS are cross-sectional studies. The most important thing to remember about cross-sectional study design is that it's a snapshot at one point in time in which you measure both the exposure and the health outcome at the same time. We we'll move over to ecologic studies. Ecologic studies make up another category of observational study designs. The key point about an ecologic study design to remember is that either the exposure or the health outcome or both are measured at a group or population level. In each of the observational study designs we've covered so far, generally exposure data and health outcome data are collected from each study participant. In contrast, you can also make measurements at a larger group level. Generally, ecologic studies use group level measurements. For example, the exposure measurement could be yearly average air pollutant concentrations in five different cities. Sometimes the health outcome occurrence, proportions or rates is only known at a group level. For example, the yearly mortality or death rates from chronic lung disease in these same cities with measured air pollution levels. Group level data averages the exposure of the group, not individuals, but individual level data provides information on the exposure of each individual. With group level data, we only know the health outcome of the entire group. We don't know the exposure of individuals who became diseased and those who did not. But with individual level data, we are able to link individual exposures to those who became diseased and those who did not. 
Linking individual exposures is a critical difference to note between individual and group level data. This leads us to the concept of ecologic fallacy, the major limitation of an ecologic study design. Ecologic fallacy means concluding that an association between the exposure and the health outcome at the group level is true at an individual level, when this may not be true. The reason for this fallacy is that we do not know the length between exposure and the health outcome among individuals within each group. That is, we don't know the number of diseased persons who were exposed or not exposed in the high exposure group or in the low exposure group. What we find at the group level may not hold in an individual level. Let's consider the hypothetical example that air pollution is higher in California than in Idaho, but mortality from lung cancer is lower in California than in Idaho. We might come to the fallacious conclusion that air pollution protects against lung disease deaths. The explanation might be that persons dying of lung disease in Idaho may have moved from high air pollution cities. We don't know the cumulative exposures of cases and non cases in either state. Consider this example of an ecologic study question. Is the ranking of cities by air pollution levels correlated with the ranking of cities by mortality from cardiovascular disease, adjusting for differences in average age, percent below poverty level and occupation? Note that in this example, there are no data at the individual level allowing us to link individual exposure to air pollution with outcomes such as cardiovascular disease mortality. Now we will discuss advantages of the ecologic study design. Group level data on exposure and health outcomes are often publicly available in state and national databases such as census data, mortality and cancer registries. So ecologic studies have lower cost and are convenient. Ecologic studies are useful for evaluating the impact of community level interventions, for example, fluoridation of water, seat belt laws, mass media campaigns, etc. We can compare outcomes at a community level before and after the intervention. In the United States and many other countries, data are regularly obtained on air quality, water quality and weather conditions, the size of the population and the status of the economy and the health of the population. For example, the United States Environmental Protection Agency collects air pollution data at selected locations all around the country using the National Air Quality Monitoring Network. These monitors collect air pollution data at the group level. In contrast, to collect individual level air pollution exposure data, a person will need to wear an exposure monitor. Ecologic studies are also useful for studying the effects of short-term variations in exposures within the same community, for example, temperature and mortality. Now we discuss limitations of the ecologic study design. We have already discussed the ecologic fallacy. Ecologic fallacy refers to concluding that association as a group or aggregate level are true at the individual level when that might not be the case. Another limitation of ecologic studies is that we cannot be confident that exposure preceded outcome. Lastly, another limitation of ecologic studies is that we do not know what happened to individual people. Thus, migration into and out of communities can bias the interpretation of ecologic studies. It's important to remember that in an ecologic study, either the exposure or the health outcome or both are measured at a group level. One example to help you remember this is the example of air pollution that is measured at a central site and is used to determine what the exposures are for a population within a 10 mile radius, for example. That's an example of an exposure that's measured at a group level.